Hello and welcome to the Unlucky Frog Gaming Podcast. You are joined by your two usual hosts here, Tom Mannering and myself, Josh Hartley. Tom, how are you doing? I'm good, I'm good. Uh, it's raining outside, so I apologise if you can hear that slamming into the window uh, <laughs> if the sound picks that up, but otherwise I'm good. Uh, how are you? I'm alright. Yeah, we were, t- we were chatting before we hit record. I've, I've had a, a, it's a busy busy work week so i'm glad it's the uh, we're recording this on saturday so glad it's the weekend and i'm getting to unwind a little bit um we've got um i wasn't sure if we were going to have a lot to talk about this week but then then i we started sort of we, we do at least plan a little bit uh and we started we started talking about subjects that we could cover off and we've actually got we've got a few bits and pieces that we can we can chat about um, where, where shall we start? We we did some actual in person real life gaming last weekend, so we could start with that. We did, we did. So last Sunday, um, prior to the episode of last week going live during the day, uh, myself and yourself, you, I'm not sure how you say that, uh, <laughs> played a game of Warhammer Forty Thousand in my uh, my little flat here. Like we were bloody invincible. I know, right? COVID be damned. I mean, we're, we're allowed to, to be fair. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, See, so yeah, it's the first time we saw each other inside in person for a good while, I think. Uh, I came over to your flat like when restrictions got eased last summer. Yeah. And then right, we yeah. have, yeah, we have seen each other in person since, but it's been outside. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was. A little, little surreal, but nice to have a bit of normality. Yeah, so, definitely. How did, how did the game go? Well, I was going to ask you the same question uh-huh. uh, <laughs> under the circumstances. Uh, so I won, uh, mm-hmm. which is a rarity, to be fair. Um, especially you say a rarity? You, you, you won your previous game of 40k as well. I did, but in my previous game of 40k, my enemy softballed me. Um, okay. Because... It, let's be honest, I'm a bit of a sulky bastard when I lose. Uh, <laughs> and I don't like playing powerless uh, uh-huh. at, at the best times. I'm, I'm self-aware, right? I know my flaws. Um, yeah. And so so when I played against uh, my friend Will uh, a week or two back, I can't just remember how long ago it was now, um, he... What did he play? He played his, his Eldar list. Mm-hmm. Um, and I played my Gene Stealer list. Um, and he very, very much uh, went fairly easy on me, uh, it's fair to say. However, uh, when I played yourself, we played a fairly reasonable match. Uh, we played. I think so. Yeah. We played Space Marines versus Necrons, so mm-hmm. uh, almost like we're out of the starter box. Um, but I was playing my old school uh, soul drinkers, like normal yeah. Marines, none of your. Primaris BS, uh, just <laughs> normal Marines on normal bases. Um, mm-hmm. An army that I've had since I was about sixteen, I think. Uh, it goes mm-hmm. goes way way back, uh, albeit having had various changes and additions over the years. And you you played your new Necrons that are all very nicely painted up. Uh, Thank you. Over yeah. the last few months, your your soul drinkers were looking pretty cool though as well. The purple color scheme's really nice on them. They're, they're decent, yeah. It, they're a weird one of my soul drinkers, and I, I said this to you at, at the time, um, because when I started painting them in the old paint range, before the new paint range came out, and then obviously when the new paint range came out, there was a slight change in the coloration pigment, uh, which meant that it was trickier to match. And mm-hmm. to, to further complicate it, when I had these soul drinkers, I lived in Carlisle, and I was working at Games Workshop, and you would quite often put your own armies in the cabinets at the front of the shop mm. uh, and I had them in the cabinets for a good like six months at one point and the the models got sun bleached uh, uh. so that paled the colour as well so you, it's not like immediately obvious but if you start picking up a few of the squads and, and comparing them you can see these slight sort of 
uh, variations in the, the sure. shades of purple. Uh, but no, I like them. You know, they're they're painted to to my standard, which is sort of a comfortable tabletop standard. Uh, yeah. No, they were looking. They were looking nice. Looking nice. So uh, you you've mentioned your your army was a lot of what what get called now firstborn mm-hmm. marines. So a bunch of tactical squads, um, a dreadnought, and a big old block of terminators mm-hmm. uh, led by a couple of characters in terminator armor as well, right? Yeah. So I had a, a librarian in terminator armor, and I had uh, a captain in mm-hmm. terminator armor. And the Terminator armored parts of my army pretty much carried me, if we're being honest. Yeah, they were they were nasty. <laughs> like it started off, and I think the beginning of the game was very sort of neck and neck. Um, no one immediately jumped ahead. Uh, you blew up my dreadnought very quickly with uh, a, a thing from your character, if I remember right. Uh, my uh, overlord has the little wrist arrow that you can shoot once per game. Yeah. So. I, 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 I was just happy that I got to do something cool with that. <laughs> yeah, and you, you kind of picked off one of my tactical squads very early, because I'd split my tactical squads into combat squads, because you had yeah. a lot of models, and you had a lot of objective control, which I was really mm-hmm. scared of at the start of the game, and I kind of grumbled straight away about how much you objective did, control yes. you had. Um, because you all your models counted as two for objective mm-hmm. control or like m- the majority of them did anyway yeah um and you know i had a, a much more elite army because it's space marines and didn't have that benefit so i was quite mm-hmm. scared uh of your objective control so i sort of split into combat squads to try and get a bit more you know control on on the board and rush yeah. one of them back and you you blew them off the map pretty quickly but then it kind of turned around when the terminators and the characters engaged the the block of your army uh and i kind of took your general out fairly early with a few mm-hmm. a few lucky shots and a few poor rolls on your part and then the terminators just sort of very slowly ground their way through everything that was left while well, you picked off the majority of the rest of my army uh but the terminators did the, the heavy lifting yeah yeah, and they, they were definitely, I would have said on your side, the MVP. Um, my MVP, I think, uh, like the regular Necron Warriors, like mm. they were just like, apart from your Terminators, like everything else really struggled to kill them. Mm-hmm. Like for like basic troops, that's exactly what you want. So yeah. I, I've got a few ideas on how I'd do things differently. I definitely, next time I'm definitely going to bring a, like a big blob of 20 of them so mm. that it's harder for them to get get killed and yeah. I, I get more value out of their reanimation stuff. Um, so I'll give that a try. And I've started uh, building up some more models. The kill team stuff that you, you gave me, basically I've started building them. So that is a character of some description technomancer i think it is okay which sounds like uh, he's into like techno music but i think his thing is giving units like a five up invulnerable save okay so he'll be really good uh and the flayed ones which are one of the most frustrating model kits that i've ever had to build <laughs> they are so fiddly and sharp yeah <laughs> right. i can imagine so I'm I'm working my way through them. I might build a few other characters as well, so that I can like paint a bunch of characters all at the same time. Um, I've got like another Overlord that I can paint up. This is the one, the really cool looking one with the big scythe and the orb mm-hmm. that he's holding. Uh, I've got some other of the like spell quote unquote spellcaster mm. type characters as well, including one that you kindly gave me in our Secret Santa, the finecast uh, one. Or the other one. Yeah, yeah, the fine cast one. Right. Okay, that's cool. Uh, and I might, I might glue, up, uh, build up a, a squad of the immortals as well. So I've got some more troops that I can pick and choose between. But Fair enough. I'll need to, I'll throw down the gauntlet for a rematch soon. Sounds maybe not, it. maybe not now. <laughs> so, <laughs> do you think you'll, do you think you'll go with the uh, space marines again, or do you want to mix it up a bit? Um, I, I don't know really. It will depend on obviously what's available when we play again. If mm. if Gene Sealers get a col- uh, get a codex in the not too distant future, um, and my army gets painted up in time, I'd I'd like to field those 
you know fully painted with a new codex that'd be awesome yeah um i want to work on some of my terrain uh time permitting in the next mm -hmm. couple of months as well uh, and finish painting that up uh and get that to kind of where i want it to be um i've got a few ideas for, I've, I've got a lot of of ideas for stuff i want to do at the moment and it's mm -hmm. it's time and picking the, the the sort of line i want to go down with it yeah that's fair um, that's fair but certainly you know I'm, I'm always up for a game um and especially against yourself since we've uh we've implemented the no unlucky frog dice rule uh i find it a lot, a lot fairer <laughs> I, I I've I've even offered to let Tom use said unlucky frog gaming dice, but he's uh, refused on principle. I have I, I I will use them in in RPGs when I'm GMing because why not? You know it's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, but I won't I won't use them in a. It, the other thing is as well, as as much as I adore those dice, they're they're quite sizable dice, and in a a tabletop game where you've got a lot of miniatures you don't really want to be chucking massive dice around yeah that's fair we see actually ugh, we've got um we've got branded dice boxes but uh, the at ben and charlotte we could maybe pick one of them back up uh, so that we can use that for our next game we should do. um yeah i have one of these i should have one of these <laughs> They were. We only got two of them made, ah, okay. and they they're both at Ben and Charlotte's. That's so, cool. um, I might I might see if I can indefinitely borrow one. <laughs> so before so. we before we move off this discussion quickly, what what was your kind of? Is this one of your first games of the new edition? I've played against you previously uh, for this edition, for ninth edition, when we played uh, my Death Guard versus your Gene Stealer cults last year. I have no memory of that game at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know uh, I lost. I was, <laughs> you lost, and uh, yeah, this was before the new Death Guard Codex came out, mm. so uh, I do Disgustingly remember. Resilient was still like the five up. Yep. Um, it's all so, coming back to me. Yeah, yeah, you remember now. It was a fun game. It was... Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> it was a game. <laughs> it, was, it was a game. We can confirm that. Yeah. Um, but no, it's uh, uh, there's a definitely a few things that I'll do different. Uh, I definitely want to keep playing with my Necrons. I've got my Death Guard that I can bring back to the table, and I've got a lot of new stuff since we played last year okay. to try out, including the big old gribbly de uh, demon prince. Uh, so I don't know. I, I could, I suppose, like time permitting. Here's the thing with 40k: you can only really play one game in a day. Mm -hmm. Like you can even if you have time, it's quite um, a mentally draining game mm -hmm. because there's a lot to remember. Yeah. So I think even if we had the time to get two games in, I don't know if I'd want to. Like it would be like, cool, we're done now. Let's just sit and chill. Yeah, I mentioned this to you when we were playing on Sunday. Um, the thing that I have noticed with the new edition, I like the new edition. Uh, mm. The core rules of it, I really enjoy. I think it's arguably one of the best editions they've released for how the game plays however to be devil's advocate against myself i mm. think it is also one of the most complex editions purely on the basis of how much you have to remember not just of the core rules the core rules are all right they're not yeah. too difficult but once you bring your army into it and i mean we were both using new codexes i was using the new space marine you were using the new necron and the amount of different rules from different like elements of your army that you have to bring in you know you've got specific rules that are applicable to your army specific rules that are applicable to your sub faction you've got command rules stratagems you've got individual unit rules it's daunting and i said to you on on sunday and i stand by it if i were a newcomer to the hobby mm -hmm. this would be the hardest edition to learn i think like i i joined in like second edition which had a lot of peripherals on it at that point in time and i would argue that was easier than yeah this edition is i uh, no i i mean i agree like i think the core rules themselves are pretty straightforward they've obviously games workshop have made a, a decision to one make this a complex game and to put the, all of that complexity at an army level rather mm -hmm. than like just the basic rules yeah i suppose it so here's the thing right you don't have to play with all the rules mm -hmm. there's nothing to say that you have to play with stratagems with all of your like uh, chap uh your chapter uh rules and all of that stuff mm -hmm. 
at the same time, that's a little bit of a feel bad because mm-hmm. it like it, you're always going to feel like, oh well, I'm just playing with one hand behind my back now. Yeah. So I get why. Yeah, in theory, you don't need to play with all the rules, but you kind of want to. Yeah. Right. Well, that's where, and I think you mentioned this on Sunday, that's where the customization and the the variability of your army comes into play from those additional rules. But we both had stuff like that on every turn, we had a different rule. We had a rule in yeah. our army that shifted. And I think both of us, at least at one point, forgot to do it because... It's just an, another level <laughs> that you have to factor in. Um, I, I don't want to naysay because I really enjoyed the game. I've enjoyed mm. all the games I've played, even the ones I've, I've lost and bitched about. But I really <laughs> enjoyed the game itself. I really enjoyed the addition. It's just, I feel, and I said this to you, I feel like you need to have a cheat sheet for your own army. Of yeah, like, yeah. On turn I... one, do this. On turn two, do this. In the shooting phase, do this, you know. I think I think there's a lot of people who do that. To mm-hmm. be fair, so that's a, that's a fair shout. It's uh, like with anything else as well. You, with practice, you, you get the hang of it. I think the I'm going to sound like oh poor me. The the difficulty with you and I is we've got multiple armies. Mm-hmm. I've got my Death Guard. I've got my uh, Necrons, and Ben is currently working on my Blood Angels. So that'll be three different armies that I've got to try and get my head around. So. I think that. over and above that as well, there's two yeah. two more factors that contribute to that. It's, it's how often you play. I mean, yes. we play really once every two months at most. Um, it's not say. very frequent. And, yeah. and that's, you know, pre-lockdown. You know, over the last year, we've had maybe two games total. Mm-hmm. And then there's also the fact of we have a lot of hobbies that have a lot of yeah. knowledge to retain <laughs> about them. You know, we, we play various board games, tabletop games, role-playing games. You know, I play computer games, you play card games. You know, so much yeah. that we, we engage with outside of, of 40K. It's not like this is our driving hobby. It's It's just one of one of many voices in a crowd Mm. (laughs) that are screaming for attention so it is quite a a complex uh you know i mean i struggle sometimes when i'm running rpgs you know i'll I'll start mixing rule systems up and i'll be like i yeah i have no idea how you are able to like g not just play but the gm the different uh systems because as a player I mean, I I, I I know the basic rules for mm. mo- like for all the games that I play, but like there's a lot of like nuance that um, that I will forget and I need to double check. Yeah. Uh, so it's, as you say, it comes from experience. You know, the the more you do it, it just becomes something you know. Um, I think my brain is probably reaching capacity. I'm not sure I, I can learn any more systems for the rest of my it's life. That quote from I'm... The Simpsons: "I read a book once, I forgot long division." <laughs> yeah, like... Pretty much. <laughs> like... You know, I've I forgot my childhood already. I'm not sure what's next to go. <laughs> Potentially dark. Let's let's move on from that. Um, right. Well, we've got other things to, to chat about that's been in the news lately. So, well, why don't you kick us off with uh, Chaosium? And they're celebrating a big birthday this year. Yeah, so 2021 is the 40-year anniversary of the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, which is insane to think about, really, because that means that... And, and I hadn't really taken this into consideration, but that means that game is older than we are. You know, it came out before we even existed, which is mind-blowing really almost as old as dungeons and dragons yeah i mean, I mean it's it's a little out but it's it's not far better. well i i'm not i i mean i i'm not counting uh, what was it was it uh, what was dungeons and Dr- chain mail there we go yeah. thank you yeah i'm not counting chain mail as dungeons and dragons even though it, it pretty much is tom, tom is on the google now <laughs> just checking You've rumbled me. checking uh, yeah, Dungeons and Dragons came out in 1974. Um, Call of okay, Call of right. Well, that is old. <laughs> so there's, there's sort of, I mean, yeah, that's ten years before I was, I was born certainly um, for D and D. It's crazy, you know. But it's, it, it goes to to show, you know, the strength of the system. It's not as prolific as D and D by any stretch of the imagination, but it's still been around for 40 years, which is crazy. I think um, one, well, per, I've, I've said on the podcast previously, but as a system, it's my favourite. Mm-hmm. I love the, the percentile style systems because the rules are, uh, they, again, there's some nuance to those rules, but they are pretty straightforward to get in your head. Like, yeah. oh, I just need to roll under this number. 
Um, so it means that you're, you're not getting bogged down with the rules and the mechanics of the game and you can actually enjoy like the, the role playing and the narrative and the investigation, yeah. which is really cool. Exactly. And also the, also the setting is class as yeah. well. It's got uh, the, the 19 sort of twenties. I think is a great setting. I was I was talking to to a friend of mine the other day, and I was saying, you know, if I could pick an era historically to live in, sort of the the twenties and thirties would probably be the one I would go for. Um, just because go you, for I mean go for go for the thirties because I think the twenties. Well, it depends on where in the world and what class you. I suppose like. If, if if you're if you're upper class in any time period, it was probably pretty sweet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, you can't go wrong. I mean, I'm I'm. It's a very sort of fantastical situation. I'm not saying you know, teleport Tom right now to, uh, you know the the 1930s. You know, mm. nothing in my in my pockets and that. Um, but yeah, if I could if I could have been a gentleman in sort of the the 20s and the 30s, um, purely because it means you can wear a suit and fedora and not look like an idiot. Um, which you know, <laughs> some people you some people need to get that memo. Yeah, they really do. Fedoras are, are very very cool in the nineteen thirties. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're not cool now. And and see if you're walking around with a hoodie and a fedora, stop it. Yeah, <laughs> just stop it. Um. Anyway, not to bash on people's fashion sense. <laughs> so the the thing that I I was going to uh, discuss. So what Chaosium are doing to celebrate this, which is is really cool, is they are doing a Kickstarter to release the uh, original uh, a re-release of the original box uh, for Call of Cthulhu that comes with the rule book, comes with some supplements and things. Mm-hmm. It's kind of the the getting started box of, of the. From what I understand, it's the first edition, you know, the, the first printing. So it is literally like a reprint of that, or they're trying to recreate it as close as possible. So exactly. that was going to be my question about it. I know that we're on the seventh edition I think that's of Call right. of Cthulhu now. Uh, so is is this, like, printed as the first edition rules were? Or, yep. right, okay. So it's, it's, it's basically, a, a, from what I understand, it is page for page what was printed originally. That's really uh, cool. Yeah, and uh, I don't know if they're adding in some supplements that weren't in the original. Obviously, I didn't have the original, and I've never looked mm. into it in any ex- ex- you know, excessive depth. It's a lot more complicated, is the original Call of Cthulhu, mm-hmm. because older games just are for some reason. Yeah. Um, but it's the original edition. Um, a couple of adventures, a couple of supplements in there. Uh, they've obviously got things like stretch goals, which are like a GM screen, I think, is one of the stretch goals, and dice. Uh, and things like that. So, it, it looks really good. Um, as much as I really like it, and as much as I'm really positive for it, and I think it's a great idea, the only nitpick I have with it is it's a company that don't need to use Kickstarter using Kickstarter. Yeah. Which is always a bit of a bugbear of mine. Because I'm like, you you realistically have the money to run this yourself and then just sell it. But maybe yeah i mean maybe they just want to do like a limited run of it so yeah. by doing it through kickstarter they know exactly how many copies that they need to make so that you know they don't under or over manufacture yeah lord knows games workshop have been having a lot of that problem lately so at least this way like everyone who really wants it will will get it yeah and they won't have to go through scalpers to to get it either although i, I dare say that will still happen but yeah, what can you do? But I mean, out, outside of that, I know of companies, and I think Chaosium might be one of the companies that do this, who do print to order. You know, who, yeah, will, who okay. will take an order and then print it and, and send it out to you. So I don't understand why they've not gone that way. I, the, the Kickstarter funded in 10 minutes mm-hmm. of, of going up. So there's there's pretty obviously an interest in this. Yeah. You know, and, and that, I wouldn't have been in any doubt about that. You know, if I'd been a Chaosium board member or whatever. I would have mm-hmm. been like, it's our 40th anniversary, people are going to buy this, we don't need to kickstart it, let's just do print on demand if we need to, or, or something similar if we don't want to take the risk, but we can we can go straight to print with this. I suppose the upside of that is they can do the stretch goals here, because yeah. it is selling so well, so they can introduce extra things that they wouldn't have, have mm-hmm. factored in. So that's, I suppose, a, a tick in the, the pro box. But I think that's really good. Um, I'm very pro Chaosium, um, as are you from from your previous yeah, experience. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wish them all the best with it. Yeah, 
Uh, well, I mean, I'm sure it'll be a massive success, and you know, everyone loves Cthulhu, so. <laughs> I, I toyed, I saw it this morning and I toyed with getting it and I was like it'd be a lovely thing to have but I wouldn't play it. Well, I'm... it would be a collector's piece, right? Yeah. If it's the very first edition. I mean, like, you'd probably run a one shot of it just to, like, go oh, this is what this game was like. Yeah, that's fair. It'd be I interesting mean... for, it would be interesting for Wizards of the Coast and Asbro to do similar with Dungeons and Dragons just so that people can appreciate how much that, because that I'm not too familiar with the previous editions of Call of Cthulhu, so I don't know how drastically it's changed, but Dungeons & Dragons has certainly changed a lot uh, in its, you know, approaching approaching 50 years of history. So, Wizards have done that. Uh, ah. They have made older uh, supplements and rules available. Um, I can't remember exactly how they do it. I'm, I think they might be a print-on-demand or a limited release thing. I've I've never sure. really looked into them because I have most of the the old editions of of D and D anyway. I think I have mm-hmm. from second edition, second, third, three point five. I skipped yeah. fourth because you know I'm a sensible person. Uh, and fifth, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but yeah, I think they have printed uh, older editions for sure because mm-hmm. I've certainly seen them in. In shops, I think you can get like the old red box and things like that. Uh, has had a reprint as well. Nice. Oh yeah, I do remember that the red box getting reprinted. So that's fair enough. Yeah, a friend of mine ran a game of it. He he picked it up and said, "Right, let's let's run a game of this." And it, these are people who are very experienced. You know, they've got yeah. decades of of D and D under their under their belts, and they're sitting there with with these old school rules with like Thaco and and all the other stuff that comes with it and they're just like this is this is ridiculous <laughs> this is <laughs> this is maths the game more so than D ever normally is yeah um i i don't recommend it i really don't as it's it's a lovely sort of delve into the history of the game but playing it is a nightmare and like there's I could go on for for hours, but like in older editions in D and D, you've got things like people have different experience to level up. So like mm. a, a wizard levels up at like a thousand, and a rogue levels up at like fifteen hundred, and these aren't right; these are just off the, the top of my head. Um, you know, and a fighter levels up at like eight hundred, and it's just mental. You know, you've yeah. got people leveling up all over the show, and some people can get to like level fifteen, some people get to level thirty, and it's just like this is. Mind. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a weird edition, man. It, it's it's before they kind of got their head together in in how it works. If you want to see a sample of it without having mm-hmm. to actually think about it, go and play the original Baldur's Gate because that uses second edition rules, uh, and you see it in practice. You know, some of your characters are level like sixteen, while someone's only yeah. level twelve, um, and things like that. And you don't have to worry about the the complexities of it then. Mm-hmm. Well, I think that kind of segues us nicely into our next topic of conversation, which is obviously uh, the new Magic the Gathering set is Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. It's all Dungeons and Dragons themed, and we've been getting all of the spoilers for the cards that are included in this set over the last couple of weeks. Uh, We've both been keeping up with them. Um, Now... I appreciate most of our audience don't play Magic the Gathering, so we're not going to get bogged down in, like, specific mechanics and, like, calling out, like, oh, this card's going to be really good for, like, Standard or Commander or whatever. But, like, broadly speaking, what what, what are your impressions of it so far? I like it. I'm mm. I'm really excited about it. The thing that has... I've, I've been excited about it since it was announced, and seeing sort of some of the cards teased up to date has, has maintained that. The thing that has really clinched it for me, though, that I really like the look of are the class enchantments, uh, which are amazing. Yeah, now, we'll, we'll, so we'll get to them in a second, but this is, my point was going to be, I love how they have took, like, the... Not just the flavour of the setting of the Forgotten Realms, but the flavour of the game of Dungeons & Dragons and put that into, like, mechanics in this set. Mm -hmm. So, well, let's just start with the the class enchantments. These are enchantment cards that you can play, and it effectively gives you, the the player, a class that you can level up through, which is really cool. Yeah, Uh, so it's it's taking a bit of a a card out of Munchkin's book, I suppose, where you you take a class, um, but in this you can have, you can multi-class as well, so you can have many of these out. Mm. You're not limited to a single one. Um, and basically 
the the one I've seen the most of is the wizard enchantment, which is a funny uh, class to have in Magic since you're all kind of wizards, but that's fine. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, that's just, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but you you play down the so it's a, a blue card I think, and mm-hmm. you play it down and like you get a, a bonus straight away just for playing it on the table, and then as soon as you like you can spend more mana to level up. And that gives you more bonuses. So I think it like increases your hand size, and then you get extra card draw and a couple of mm-hmm. other things as it kind of uh, levels up more. Um, but you can have like the wizard one down, and you can have like potentially the barbarian one down. You know, and you'd be a wizard barbarian, yeah. um, which is is so cool. Um, mm-hmm. It's one thing that when I started playing Magic in the the older editions of it, there was a lot more focus on you as a player as well you know that you were a wizard you were a really powerful person they've come away from that a bit yes in the, the later editions and there's more focus on the planeswalkers themselves you know as your avatars if you will you know mm-hmm. having jace or gideon or anyone like that but this is a nice way to kind of turn it back round and make it you know you're the wizard you're the, you're the character that's that's mm-hmm. involved behind all this uh, which i really like um yeah, I, I really don't have anything more to say. I think they're really cool. No, uh, likewise, a, a great way of sort of representing that in game. But it's not just that. It's um, we we get to roll twenty sided dice for mm-hmm. some of the cards. There's a card called Treasure Chest that you roll, and that determines it gives you a different effect depending on how lucky you are in what you find in your treasure chest. Yeah. Um, it is set in Dungeons and Dragons, so naturally one of the new mechanics is dungeons. So there's like one of three dungeons that you're uh, you can explore uh, using a, a new mechanic that's tacked on to creatures. From what I can see, which is venture. Mm-hmm. So each time you play a creature with venture, uh, you get to go a little bit deeper into whatever dungeon. And the dungeons are named after famous dungeons from Dungeons and Dragons, they are which neat. is another neat uh, touch. And and to top it all off, we've got uh, some famous characters from the Forgotten Realms have been printed onto cards. And I think that the one that I, I think is probably going to be the most recognized and the most beloved is they have printed Minsk and Boo, which I believe, and someone else correct me if I'm wrong, I believe Boo is the first instance of a creature type hamster in Magic the Gathering. So... I might be wrong on that. I it's, might be wrong. They're not. I don't know if it was a hamster, but I remember there was a there was an unglued card, and it mm-hmm. was like a little hamster with a scarf on, and it was a black card, and it was like the unspeakable horror or something it was called, uh, and it was a little like hamster with a winter you, scarf on, on an ice right. skating rink. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Okay, so that was the the art was like a little black hamster with his scarf. Yeah, it on. looks like a Christmas card. Like it was it was one of my favorite magic cards um, that I had back in the day. I gotta look this up now. Is it? But is it creature type? I can't remember hamster. if it was creature type hamster. Uh, I, it might even be like creature type horror or something because it was it was jokingly supposed to be the most horrific thing you could encounter. It was this Christmas gerbil thing? <laughs> I'm trying to find it. Uh, I'm, I'm finding I'm finding a lot of like fan made hamsters. I've got it. Uh, so the card was called the Infernal Spawn of Evil. Yes. Uh, it isn't a hamster. Uh, it is a demon. Uh, but the demon is scribbled out, uh, and in red it's written uh, beast. Uh, so it, it's not unfortunately a hamster uh, although the picture is some sort of rodent uh, it's, it's so good it's a little rodent he's got a little red and white scarf on he's holding like a hot chocolate with some marshmallows on it nice and it's do you a know what that, card. do you know what that joke is in reference to I genuinely don't know okay so there is a card in Magic the Gathering I can't remember the exact name this was way 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 back when and it was a something Lemur now, a Lemur in, like, folklore is a type of ghost, mm-hmm. right? Uh, but this was perhaps when, like, you know, this was pre-internet and maybe the correspondence uh, between art- the artists and, like, the art directors and everything was- maybe wasn't so great. And the artist misread that as Lima, as in the type of monkey. So uh, the the art for this card is actually, like, and it's a, it's a black card and it's, like, this little black Lima. <laughs> <laughs> like rather than a ghost, <laughs> so 
<laughs> I believe that that is what that is in reference to. Someone mistaking what the what the thing is supposed to be. I like that. I I, yeah. I really enjoy like the just to get slightly off track. I I love the silver bordered sets. Like it's it's magic laughing at itself, which yeah. is the right way to be. Yeah, magic having fun. I've got um, Thomas from Geekaboo. Uh, he has an uncube, which oh, okay. I have played once, and it is wild. <laughs> I can imagine. The one I always remember sticking out, we we used to play magic at my friend's on his, his bedroom floor. There was like four of us, and mm. there was the denim minotaur uh, who had denim yes. walk. Uh, <laughs> so you couldn't block him if you were wearing any denim. Uh, so you get people who like before you were playing, you know, they'd go and change into a pair of sweatpants or something, just so nice. that you could denim walk them. Yeah, nice. Um, back to uh, back on track then. So, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms uh, is coming out. I believe pre-release is in. It's either next week or a fortnight. Mm-hmm. So, I'm gonna be taking part. Sadly, Geekaboo are still not doing in-person events. So I'll probably be doing it over webcam. Right. Is this is this a set you're planning to to give a go? It's a set I am going to be buying. Uh, certainly, I'm probably going to. It's going to be one of the first times I'll pick up a box for a very long time mm. um, because I definitely want some of this stuff. I don't play a lot of Magic. I actually can't remember the last time I played a game, but I don't want to miss this set. And then you know, six months down the line, I play a game and I don't have stuff from a really cool yeah. set. Uh, so I'm probably going to pick up a box. I won't be doing the pre-release because that weekend uh, my mum's actually coming up to visit oh. uh, and that takes priority because I've not seen her for 16, 18 months now. That's fair. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm going to... Uh, I'll be giving a skip on the pre-release, unfortunately, but I will uh, be picking up a box to this and I'll probably be uh, pulling yourself over for a couple of games, I imagine. Yeah, more than happy to oblige. Yeah. Uh, Righty oh, and moving on from that, I think the last little bit of news to talk about, uh, just to touch on, is uh, Arkham Horror the Card Game uh, by Fantasy Flight. They've announced a new core set for it. So um, you'll have heard us talking about Arkham Horror on previous episodes of the podcast. We really like it. Ben and Charlotte really got into it, and they they bought a ton of the expansions for it, and uh, they were playing through a lot of the the campaigns themselves with it. So, but um, uh, Fantasy Flight have decided to uh, rejig the the core set. Uh, important to note: this isn't a new edition, so this isn't going to make any cards obsolete or anything like that. This is basically to. I, I, I'm. I'm going to read uh, just just off my source here. Uh, this is the still the same Arkham Horror the card game that many have come to know and love over the past five years, and none of the cards included in the revised core set are new to the game. The rules are the same. The campaign is the same. The experience is the same. Even the cards are mostly the same, with the only difference being the inclusion of a handful of higher level cards from some of the game's earlier expansions to give newer players more options when spending experience. But even then, these cards already exist as part of the game, which means that if you already have all the existing uh, products, then there uh, there won't be anything in the revised core set that you will need from yourself. However, this is the perfect opportunity to introduce a friend or family member to the game. It comes with everything a newcomer needs to get their uh, collection started, including a full playset of cards and components to support up to four players for the initial campaign. So, nothing new, but uh, a bit of a... I'm guessing that Fantasy Flight have done this as like a little bit of a shot in the arm for for the system, so that it will encourage some new people to to get in on on, on that. Have Have you played... Arkham Horror at all, Tom? I think I played once with Ben, Charlotte, and yourself a couple mm. of years ago. Uh, I was really interested in it when it came out, but it kind of ran away from me. Uh, yeah. And as some of these games do, uh, you get to a point where there's so much the prospect of kind of getting into it is, is a bit daunting. Mm-hmm. Um, because you don't really know where to jump in. Uh, and, you know, there's, playing catch-up is fiscally just not viable. You know, yeah, uh, because you you'd have to buy 
umpteen expansions and they're not cheap and And that's always like the one of the issues with these living card games it's fine if you're in at the ground floor and you just keep up with it 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 it, you're still spending the same amount of money but you're 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 doing it at a more reasonable pace whereas like if you try and get in well evidently arkhamora is five years old now can you imagine trying to buy all of the sets over five years it's gonna cost a lot yeah Definitely. I mean, it's, it's one of the problems I had with, with Legendary. I mean, I started Legendary a few years ago, and I had a lot of sets to catch up on, and I, I spent mm. hundreds of pounds yeah. just to get to where I was at that point in time. And that's before, you know, the past few years have, have come and gone, and I, I couldn't even imagine going into it now how much you would have to spend. I mean, you couldn't. A lot of the sets just aren't available anymore, but you mm-hmm. just couldn't get all the sets. You know, it it, it break you. You know, you'd be spending hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pounds on these things, and I, th- I imagine the same is could be said of Arkham Horror. You know, and and I don't know if they're all still available as well, or if they go out of print after a certain period of time. Mm. What I think this is good though is it it kind of gives you a soft reset, so they're not invalidating what's come before. Yeah, but they're saying here's a new revised core set, here's a nice jumping off point. If you want to get the old stuff, great. But if you don't, you can just pick this up. And if you want to then add some stuff to it, you can do. So it gives you like a nice... It doesn't invalidate the people who have spent hundreds and hundreds of pounds. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it, it includes, you know, everyone, new and old, which is a really good way to do it. And it sounds like they're being pretty sensible. They're they're keeping it the same and just making a few amendments for for the benefit of new newcomers. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So- I, I think the other thing that helps with Arkham Horror is that it isn't a competitive game mm-hmm. in nature. It's cooperative. So it's a bit different for, see, like, competitive living card games like Game of Thrones and Netrunner. Like, you you need everything, really. <laughs> or, or you certainly need very specific things to make whatever deck you're trying to build work. Whereas with this, it's a bit more casual. And, yeah. like, so... Yeah. Well, that's, that's part of the, the appeal, isn't it? I mean, I... I really like these kinds of games, and and the time I did play Arkham Horror, I did really enjoy it. I think the the only tricky thing, and I found this with Champions, because Champions has a very similar sort of vibe to it. Mm-hmm. It's not quite as narrative, but it it follows a lot of the same sort of uh, paths. Is you need a regular group to kind of keep going. So Ben and Charlotte are quite yeah. good. They have each other they play with, and they they just play two player. Or sometimes you went and played with them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have kind of this consistent group. I find unless you've got a dedicated group or a couple of people that want to like make a fixture, whether it's once a week, once a month, whatever, you're you're going to struggle to get the benefit of, of these kind of living card games that have the narrative storyline to it, um, unless you want to play it on your own, obviously. Um, that is kind of my one sort of issue with them because I've, for example, with Champions, I've got all of Champions to date and I've played a lot of it myself and I played in the early days I played games with yourself and Ben um, but obviously then COVID hit Mm -hmm. um, and you're suddenly put in this position and it could be similar if like your group breaks up where you've got all this content but not really people to play it with or people are willing to invest the time uh, which is a shame uh, because they're great games you know and and, uh, Arkham Horror especially has a, a really fun narrative thread that runs through it and uh, we've we kind of watched uh, went to see one of the shows about it at um, UK Games Expo a couple mm. of years back, and I had no real understanding of the game, uh, but it was still fun to watch people kind of talking about something they were excited about. Um, and even with with lot limited knowledge I had, you you got a feel for what they were doing. Um, so yeah, it's I think it's a good idea. I I, I support it. Yeah, yeah. You could exactly. put my seal of approval on it. FFP. The Tom seal of approval. I'm gonna. We're gonna have to get that made now. You can just start stamping stamp it things. at cons. <laughs> yeah, I like this. <laughs> yeah, don't, sir. Please stop. <laughs> this is the demo copy. It's the only one yeah. we have. <laughs> stop well, stamping approved. everything. Yes. So I think on that note, that is uh, uh, just about time. Uh, so thanks as always very much for for listening to us, guys. And as always, until next time, take care. Bye. Thank you.